These are just polarizing microscopy pictures of these regions that grow from simple nucleation. And you get something like this, which is called a Walton's cross. I won't go into how that comes from, from, the, from the structure. But basically, the structure is a central nucleus, which radiates like a spokesable wheel. And when you do this on a polarizing microscopy, it looks like this. This is a big, a, a big uh, domain that is a region uh, uh, of the region. And this is a, a whole bunch of smaller ones where they're tightly tight packed together. So let's look at a higher resolution level now and see what happens within the network. These are all sickle fibers, and over time they grow. They grow at about uh, something like two microns per second, uh, which is two one, two one thousandth of a millimeter. And you can see they're branching also until you finally get a big network. This is in real time. So this is a little faster than real time. You can see the time at the bottom down here. So what's the mechanism? Well, the red cells come out of the lungs. And let's assume they have no polymer in there because they've been in the lungs, they've seen oxygen, and all the polymers dissolve. Actually, all the polymer doesn't dissolve, but uh, let's say, for, for a moment, let's say that it does. It goes down the big arteries, the aorta and so forth, and comes to the small arteries, which are the arterioles. Eventually gets into the arterioles, gets into the capillaries, where it loses its oxygen to the tissues, and therefore it starts to gel. And it may do three things. If, if it's lucky, it will go through and come out on the venous side of the circulation without doing any damage. Or it may get stuck and polymerize in the venous system, which won't be so bad because the veins are fairly big. Or it can get stuck in the capillaries or the smallest vessel and block up the whole capillaries and, and initiate what's called a sickle cell crisis, which are the uh, char characteristic acute events of sickle cell disease, disease which are very painful. Um, so those are the three things, these are basically the things that can happen in sickle cell disease and in crisis. Now, so in summary, uh, really sort of the cartoon summary, uh, just a schema, but just to indicate, to try to orient you, the polymerization causes vasoocclusion, but it also causes a lot of other things. It causes uh, ion fluxes across the med cell membrane, water fluxes, so you get concentration of hemoglobin dehydration. You get different kinds of leaks. One is called P-sickle, which is also the same thing. It leads to dehydration, but the mechanisms are different. The bilayer, the lipid bilayer of the red cell, there can be inversions of that, the uh, interior and outer, uh, exterior leaflets. The rheology of the membrane, that is to say its flexibility, is damaged. Eventually, the red cell is destroyed. That's hemolysis. What hemolysis? That is to say, lysis of the, of the red cell. And those people get anemia, which is why it's uh, called sickle cell anemia. Pieces of the red cell membrane can break off and form little vesicles, that is to say, small spherical uh, cell like things. Uh, there are other factors which cause vasoocclusion besides the direct polymerization. One is cell to cell adhesion. There are adhesion molecules when the cell is damaged, which cause the cells to stick together. And that's the aspect that I will not talk about, but it's, it's an area of greater interest now. I think, for the moment, it's of greater interest than the, than the physical chemical aspect, which I'm going to talk about, which I'm talking about. Um, that's the question of fashion. Sometimes one thing is important, sometimes the other. But I think it's fair to say that both are really important. Other things, such as vasoconstriction, also exacerbate the vasoocclusion. So there are many, many processes involved in this, and we will focus basically on, on the polymerization and its immediate consequences. So the first aspect of what I'm going to talk about is the structure. The structure of domain, uh, gels, the domains that arise from the nucleations, the fibers themselves, uh, and the interactions involved. So this is an electron micrograph, not from my laboratory, it's from the literature, um, of a sickle cell fiber. Uh, and you can see it's, it's twisted. It's narrow here, and it's... Is that out? Is that out? Comes out okay. It's narrow here and wide over here, and the dimensions are known. That is to say, the pitch, the distance from one narrow region to the next is about 200 angstrom. It's 270 uh, nanometers. Uh, when this picture is analyzed, you can see how the molecules relate to each other. Each circle is a molecule, and it's, it's twisted. Right? 
There are 14 strands in this structure, and if you take the outer 10 away, you get four that are left in the middle, and it looks like this. And here's a combination. Here's where you have 14 strands. Here's where you have 12 strands. If you look at it in cross-section, you can see here, and the strands have been conventionally numbered, starting 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth, around there into the interior. So these interior strands don't touch the external environment, but uh, all the other strands do. So this is different from a microtubule, because a microtubule has a hollow center. This is a solid rope. So really, it's like a whole bunch of strings, which you twist like that, and you get a solid rope. This is the schema of that solid rope looked at from one end. And you notice that two strands are highlighted. Two strands are highlighted because the strands come in pairs. That is to say, they one strand sticks to another strand, and then seven of those double strands form the actual fiber. Uh, it's not necessary to go into the details of that, but that was an important, important development in understanding the structure. And, uh, okay. So, so much for the structure of the fiber and a little bit about the gel. Now I'd like to talk about the hemoglobin, uh, and then we'll come back to the to signal. This is a hemoglobin molecule, which contains four subunits, that is to say four polypeptide chains. Uh, it has a molecular weight of about 64,500, so it's a medium-sized protein. The four groups, the four chains are the different colors, uh, green, green, yellow, and so forth. These are the two, I'm not sure if these are the alpha or beta chains. Let's say they're the alpha chains, these two. And these two underneath are the beta chains. This red thing stuck into the side like a penny in clay, these are the heme groups, and that's where the oxygen binds, on one side of the heme group. The other side of the heme group is attached to the protein and hangs from the protein.